Two cents a pound. Two cents and I think I picked about 25 pounds a day for a four year old, believe it or not. All right. You do the math. That's about 50 cents a day I made. <laughs> but as I went along, I eventually picked over 200 pounds. Alice, how much does the pooper scooper get? I think it was very low. Not much. No. <laughs> so I don't remember. Um, I really don't remember how much, but it, you know, it helped me in, you know, as a later on in life to buy my own high school class ring and announcement. Wow. And all that stuff as I kept working and doing small jobs yeah. like that. So. Ruth, do you remember how much you got at the five and dime? No. Well, I know baby was for thirty-five cents an hour. 35 cents an hour. But one day I babysat for 11 hours and got two dollars. So I wouldn't be able to I'd say that I'd say that calculator was rusty. That's right. I plowed. I plowed. With King Mules. My goodness. Fifty cents an acre. New ground. You guys had real jobs, huh? Yeah. yeah. We had real hard work. I chopped cotton also all day long, sun up to sun down. They paid you two dollars a day. That's 1956. And how'd you feel about that wage? Well, I thought it was okay because I didn't know any better. 1956. What do you mean chopping? Well, I, I, I don't take up the whole study. When they plant the seed, they plant them all in a row, and then it grows up and will choke it out if you don't thin it. Chop it. Chop. Then you also get out the grass. Um, so you space it. Um, huh. Remember what your first castoring job paid? Uh, 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 let me think here. I think I got 
Maybe it might have been 14,000, but that might be high. I don't know. Wow. You started off in management, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was in uh, 70, uh, 78. Okay. So that, that, but see, I was in the suburbs of Philadelphia. The problem was the cost of living was out of there. I thought it was a lot coming from Texas. So we build hay. From sun up to sun down, about 50 cents an hour. 50 cents an hour. Sun up to sun down. Yep. You guys put in some days, huh? We loaded up in the barn by lighting the outside. You got to remember, chopping, they're not making any money. That's expense. Uh, okay. So, so you pick the cotton until it grows up. You, so they, they didn't pay you much to get it ready. Well, I'm on 50 cents an hour maybe, and I should say that. Okay. My sister kept getting too many jobs, and she couldn't be in two places, so she sent me her place. Oh, you were a subcontractor, huh? Yeah, I worked with boys, but then she sent me to a place where there was a baby baby, and I didn't know what to do. That was a whole other story. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's So, Rollin, would you uh, turn to chapter 5 of James for me and read 1 through 6? Let's see if I can find James. This time. In it's in the J's. I know. <laughs> Peter, James, and John had a little. Okay, there, now I can remember how to write Peter, James, and John had a little sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter. Well, where'd James go? Right after Hebrews. I uh, know. James is that. First chapter? Hebrews, that's five. the coffee chapter. Yeah. Five. five verse six, did you say? Five? Yes. In James. Yes. Said One Peter. through six. One through six. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Yes, sir. Am I in the right one? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which have kept you back by fraud, are crying against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter i think that's five you verse six, six, six okay you have condemned and murdered the righteous person he does not resist you so uh one of james's more stark uh sets of scripture all of chapter five really is a little bit in your in your face uh we need to give some perspective to what he's writing here in terms of how it applies to us and uh, what's appropriate or not in terms of our pursuit of things and how we think about things. So let's go ahead and watch Francis Chan. Here's about a 10 minuter tonight and then we'll uh, have a discussion. So as we get into James chapter 5, this is probably the strongest warning he has in the book, in my opinion. The language he uses is pretty devastating. Um, and I, I would just like to say at this point, it's very easy to take a passage like this and go, oh, he's not talking about me. I guess what I would beg you to do is don't just assume this doesn't apply to you. He's speaking to the rich here, and he has some very choice words for them. And I understand that some of this is about people who are taking advantage of the poor or, or uh, gaining money um, in a way that wasn't ethical and taking advantage of others. But there's, there's other warnings here that I think really apply to us. And sometimes we can quickly go, oh, that's not me, because it's, 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 uh, 
with such strong language, it's hard to imagine it appealing to us. And this is the frustration of, of not being right there with you and talking this through. So I really encourage you to talk this through with someone. Be honest with what do the words actually say and does this apply to me right now? Um, just the strength of these words should cause us all to go, let me make sure he's not talking about me. Uh, because we live in a, a time when a lot of us are pretty well off. Um, we are pretty well taken care of. And those riches aren't always a blessing. They can actually be a distraction to the things that God wants of us. And here in James 5, verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Those are pretty crazy terms. Weep, howl, because this misery is about to come upon. He's talking about the return of Christ. He's talking about this coming judgment. And he's speaking to those who are rich. And he says, you better be careful. Um, he says, your riches have rotted. Your garments are... He has all this stuff that everyone thinks is a blessing. Watch what happens with it. In fact, he says, they will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. He's confronting the people who, who were hoarding wealth, who were using their resources for themselves. And he says, look, you've just saved up all this money in the last days. And what's crazy about this is... It's usually like if someone passed away and they had a bunch of stuff, we would say, man, what a blessing. What a blessed life that guy had. And what scripture is saying is like, you know, all of those possessions that he laid up for himself are going to be evidence against him. In other words, his assets suddenly become liabilities. And it's, it's, it's this picture of a courtroom. And here's the evidence that's against you. Here, here's proof that you were not about the widows and the orphans and true religion. You're about yourself. Look at all of this stuff now testifies against you because you have laid up treasure in the last days. It's this picture of a person not using what he's been given or what she's been given to practice true religion, which is caring for the widows and orphans, like he says in chapter 1. And, and it's, you know, right there at the end of chapter 4, he's talking about how when you know there's something good you can do and you don't do it, that's sin. It's not just when I speak negatively about someone else that that's sin, but it's no, when I know there's something I could be doing, and instead of investing in all these other people, I'm laying up treasure for myself and he, he, he says it's, it's, it's like fattening yourself for the day of slaughter. It's just like a, a cow just consuming all this food, not, not realizing this is all to your own detriment. And he's saying now all the stuff you've stored up for yourself is actually evidence that you didn't care about others. You were thinking about yourself. You were laying stuff up for yourself. And he says, and you did it in the last days. What a waste. And, and it's getting us to think through, does it really make sense for me to be storing up more and more for me in the future of my, my children and grandchildren when there are people whose kids are dying today, like this week? How can I not care when there are people who, who've never heard the word of God, never heard the name of Jesus, and I'm not using my resources to get to them? James says, look, when you know what's good and you don't do it, it's a sin. It's a sin of neglect. And then he goes on. He says, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So now he confronts those who've been dishonest and who held something back and thought that they got away with it. They're saying, you didn't get away with anything. In fact, the cries of those people, God himself literally heard that. A, a, a huge warning to us that if we've done anything illegal, deceptive, you know, to the detriment of others, thinking that we may have cheated them a little bit, we didn't get away with anything. But then the, the, the other warning at the end is he says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Um, it's a word that refers to like a, 
living a soft life. It's like really setting yourself up here on the earth. See, this isn't what a believer does. Um, we don't sit here for ourselves in our self-indulgence. We don't just set ourselves up in the best situation possible. He says that's that's like fattening yourself up for the day of slaughter. You're just you're just asking for it. Rather than being on the mission that God's called us to, and rather than using these resources He's given us for the sake of others and practicing true religion, instead we're just sitting back and doing nothing. And uh, that we have to be very careful here of, of living lives that are for ourselves, for self-indulgence. Look, I know I've been teaching for about 30 years in this country, and I know whenever we talk about money, people get very defensive and go, well, but it's okay, God wants me to enjoy this. And I'm just saying, just, just, just read the book. That, that's the point of going through Scripture, is that you would read it and tune out all the other voices and just go, okay, what does it say? Am I living in luxury? self-indulgence does it really make sense for me to live this way when life is so short does it really make sense for me to live this way when other people are dying right now just for a lack of food lack of clothes lack of water does it really make sense biblically not now looking around and going what are all these opinions again get into the word and go man am i guilty of this all through the Old Testament, God warns of those of us who don't care about the injustices of the world. And just at the end of the last chapter, he's saying, look, if you know what's right, you don't do it. That's a sin. And then he gives this crazy warning to those of us with resources and say, man, make sure you're not just fattening yourself up for the day of slaughter. And maybe the worst thing we can do is make this some sort of legalistic, okay, so if you spend over 20000 on your car or over half a million on your house or this or that, like at what point is it sin? That's not the issue. Again, it's, it's about getting back to the heart. It's like as believers, what we're supposed to be characterized is we're not attached to the things of this earth. It's like, man, but can't I have this? Can't I? If, if those are the questions you're asking, again, look inside, look at your heart and go, man, am I really longing for his return? Because as believers, we're supposed to be people who are consumed uh, with this return of our, of our bridegroom coming to get us in, in the, the, the next life and the new heavens and the new earth, knowing like he just taught that life is short on this earth, and so we focus on the next. And so again, let's, let's, let's not argue about this object or that object and whether it's right to get it. Let's instead just look at our hearts and go, why do I long for these things so much? And why am I acquiring more and more for myself and neglecting those who are in need? Because this is the very thing that Jesus saves us from. It's this self-centeredness, self-indulgence, where he gives a love for him and a love for people. felt about what we received and then what we did with it. Uh, it might be kind of a, a challenging thing for us to look at because rich people uh, kind of took a direct shot from James and uh, it might not be easy for us to think of ourselves as rich. But I guarantee you, on a world scale, the poorest of us in here <coughs> is a king or a queen. Uh, 
even in other industrialized nations, when you go there and you see how those folks live on their average income, and you look like what somebody in America could have on a comparable average income, we are very much rich people. But we do exist within the framework of a very rich society. So does that mean each and every one of us needs to act like we're rich, like James is accusing the rich of being? And the answer to that is I don't think so, unless the things you have are for some reasons other than um, what God has provided to you. Uh, I think that God knows what each of us needs and makes ways for us to have it, but there is also certainly the personal and prideful pursuit of stuff. And that's what James is talking about. Yeah. Well, and he referenced the widows and the orphans. Uh, in our system today, with the monetary system being much different than it was then. Back then, there was no support. Yeah. And we have orphanages and things like that, and we have hospitals and all kinds of things for the ones that's been neglected and cast aside. Um, and I think we should support those beyond what our what taxes and all that does. And many denominations have children homes. Sure. Uh, and often churches get involved in help. I used to do that. Tupelo uh, Children's Mansion to an organization. And then there's another one since then. But um, I don't directly know of one. We don't seem to push it here. But um, this, this comes into question uh, because of he stressed the widows and orphans uh, and our system here is somewhat different than it was in biblical days correct they had no way no way no way yeah so the question then is um, not so much what we have per se is what we do with what we have is more of the question. Uh, it, I don't suppose it matters what house you live in or what car you drive. If those are just things that you have because you can have them, they don't mean that much to you. It's not uh, who you are, so to speak. And it doesn't stop you from doing um, as Scripture would have us do with what we have. If, that's all, if that all fits within the concept of your life, then that's fine. But if you're going after things, and you're doing things that are draining your resources, including your time and keeping you, maybe you have to work so many shifts or so many jobs and you can't come to church, maybe you're not attending to your family the way you should, um, maybe even you don't have to work that hard, whatever this thing is. Um, I've, I've lived in an area where boating is a lot more prevalent than it is around here, and I've seen lots of bass boats cause divorces. Um, so, uh, not only for the expense, but the time away from the family that it takes, and it opens the door to lots of um, difficulties. So... Um, even those who don't struggle financially to obtain something like that, the end result is they're not spending time, as much time with their family as they should or could. And so now the boat is not a thing of God. It's not for enjoyment. Now it is a trap. So it's not having something that's the problem. It's the reason for having it and the end result for having it. Um, and so that's what, that's what we need to think of now. Do you think this letter was written to all rich people ever? Say that again. You mean this letter from James, do you think it was written to all rich people forever? <laughs> yeah. 
Huh? I'm going to say that it, it, the principles are here. The thing we've got to understand, even in Jesus' day, like take Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, both those men of great wealth, and yet they were his disciples, you know what I mean? And Joseph of Arimathea gave him a tomb. And yeah. Etc. So there have been wealthy people throughout the history of the church, so to speak, that have uh, gave and gave and gave. You know, I mean, like, I'm talking about people that would keep 10% to live on and give 90% away. People like that, really. Yeah. And uh, that wouldn't be what he's talking about here. He's talking about people that, I really like to say, are worshiping things. And because of that worship of things, God gets pushed aside, and so does your family or whatever. I remember there was a country song where the guy said, uh, I think she gave him an ultimatum about his boat. Okay. And he said, I'm sure going to miss I'm you. Gonna miss I'm going to miss you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I threw that in. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. He wants them to read it. I thought about that when we were talking about it. And I thought, oh, I ain't bringing that up. So thank you. <laughs> so we can agree that James is talking to people either when it was written specifically or in general now, who use their wealth badly. But is there still a lesson here for us? And and how does God want us to use our resources, do you think? Wisely. <clears throat> and generously, too. Yeah. Even the principle's still there. He, he was reprimanding them for taking a fraud, he said, yeah. Uh, and withholding from the people that was working. Uh, we can do the same thing today if, if, if we have employees and, and hold them back from what's really fair and what you know you should be paying them. I've seen companies do that. In fact, I got reprimanded for training a man because he didn't, couldn't read computer programs and I taught him how. And so he said, he went in and after I taught him and said, I either get a raise or I'm going to another company. Well, they were pretty upset with me for training. <laughs> and all I was trying to do is help the man be better and he, that way he could do a better job for them. But they resented yeah. having to pay him for it. That's not right either. So I know an individual professor, a very sharp individual, and gives to charity uh, but not until December 31st. He writes every check to every charity on December 31st after he figures out which tax bracket it can land him in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a I mean, the, the money goes to charity. Yes. Right. But, but how does that work into, you figure, James's view of using resources? It wasn't given in love. Yeah. Good point. Very good. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, let's chime in there. The concept of stewardship covers yeah. a broad spectrum. It's how you earn it. You know, you can you can make a lot of money at the casinos. You know what I mean? But God's not pleased with that kind of money. You know what I mean? You're not. No. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what I mean? There's a lot of ways of earning money that's yeah. pleasing to God. Yeah. There's a lot of ways of, and, and it's not just the giving the tithe to the Lord, but it's also what do you do with the other part, too? You know, there's a total aspect of stewardship, and it's not even just your money, it's your time and your talents and all that. It's all a part of what God wants us to look at, you know. And evidently, He's the only people that have just the opposite view as what God has here. Let's look at a couple of passages. Proverbs 11.28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fail, but the righteous will thrive. Like a green leaf. <coughs> All right. Mine says it will fall. Yeah. How about Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 22? 
Jeremiah 22, 13 through 17. Anybody who feels like it. Jeremiah 22, 13 through 17. Elaine, stop. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work, that saith, I will build me a wide house and a large chamber, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar, and painted with vermilion. Shalt thou reign because thou clothest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. Seventy. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. So Jeremiah criticizes one king for an extravagant lifestyle. I didn't know what vermilion was. I looked it up. Pretty fancy stuff. City up north. Yeah, city up north <laughs> there a little ways, right? Bright red. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's a bright red. It's a bright red color. <clears throat> Was very expensive even then. Uh, and then he uh, compares him with his father. So. What's the, the two different comparisons there, you figure? The two different ways of life described here. You've got one building a house much larger than he needs and buying expensive vermilion for the walls and then having a wide chamber and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, then you have one doing quite the opposite. So I think it's not the, the illustration here, it's not the having, it's the how, how you have, I guess, would be the best way to put it. And then one more scripture. Uh, Malachi 3 5. Anybody who's ever done a offertory scripture should know that one. Malachi. Malachi, end of the Old Testament. Three five. I will come to you in judgment, and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the widow and the fatherless, and cheat the wage earner, and against those who deny justice to the foreigner. They do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Wow. So, apparently we're supposed to take care of those folks. Or, in not doing so, um, this display a lack of fear of the Lord, which is not a good thing. So back to, bless you, back to James 5, 1. What's the first thing that James wants rich people to do? Yeah, wants them to weep, right? And wail or, or, or howl or, yeah. So Why? For their misery. They are coming upon them, it says. A judgment comes, judgment day comes for everybody. It's a good account. So, why, why is it so important for, for James to point out that they need to be weeping and howling, or I think some translations say wailing? Because it's going to happen. He said yeah. it's going to happen in, in the future. Um, you know, um, you you give the one charity, and then you get about twenty more requests. And yet, when I worked in that department, you can never give enough. And that's what's 
sometimes makes people decide not to give in. So, I can see that. I think James just doesn't want us to trust in our wealth. Right. right. He doesn't want our wealth to be any sort of a comfort um, to us spiritually, as, as some might think. He's connecting this very strongly to many things that Jesus said, uh, particularly uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you take a look at a couple of thing that, things that Jesus taught from Luke's version of that, um, let's go to Luke 6. Twenty-two, or viente dos, if you prefer. Uh, twenty-two what? Luke six twenty-two through twenty-six. Whoever cares to read that. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil, because of the Son of Man. What was the? 23 as well? 22 through 26. Okay. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are, fell, who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so, if you're lowly, there's good news coming. <laughs> if you're doing okay now, there's not such much good news coming, right? And so, I don't believe Jesus is talking about people who are using their resources wisely. I believe that rich is applying to folks who have a lot and are using others to get more. Or they have a lot and they're okay with having a lot. And they're also <laughs> treating people without as much not so good too. Correct. Also making a point of people who are Power. seeking the approval of others, right? We're not to do that. We're to live for an audience of one, right? And so we don't need the approval of others. It's probably easier to do in some workplaces than others. But um, I think Luke is just trying to get us to understand some perspective on how and what we have and how it's to be used uh, the way Jesus directed. Let's turn to Luke 6. Did we just read 22 through 26? Yes. 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 We just read. Oh, wrong scripture. Matthew 6. Sorry about that. Matthew 6. 19 through 21. And while we're reading this, see if you can make some connections to James chapter 5. But right now we want Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Or your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So now we get to the point of having stuff to have stuff. Because you have to acquire it, which means you have to make some plans for it. You have to use resources for it. And then you have to maintain it, right? And probably get ready to buy the next better version or whatever, right? 
And so then that is where your heart has to be. If it's not, then you can't afford it. Or you can't keep it, and you definitely can't have the next model, right? So what Jesus is pointing out to us is where your heart is is where your treasure is going to naturally flow. Uh, a wise pastor once told me, show me somebody's checkbook and their calendar and I'll tell you what's important to them. Right. And so, um, I've hidden my checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I haven't seen it in about 20 years. I can't even tell you what color it is. I'm, I'm not allowed to have it. <laughs> For good reason. For good reason. All right. So, what connections do you see with James chapter 5? And what about the lay up treasures in heaven portion of this? Well, he's using the same analogy of your, the rust of your material things. In both places, we see that. Yep. And so... The emphasis of Jesus is here to, instead of doing all that effort to have these things that are just going to rust or have moss eat up and all like that, put your energy in things that you can send on ahead, basically, into heaven, which is yeah. giving and caring and you know, kindness and a lot of different things. That's correct. We should be using our resources here to build in heaven. Now, we're not going to really have things in heaven, but the analogy is things that will matter for our eternity and not things that are going to matter now. It doesn't matter what it is, as soon as it leaves the factory, it starts returning to the earth. Everything you see around you, even the newest car out in the lot, is decaying yep. and heading back to one, from whence it came. Some of them faster than others, and uh, some things faster than others, depending on what it was made out of. But every single thing is heading back to its original state. Uh, so, that's the point of the scripture is, don't store up things where moths ruin and rust decays, um, because you'll be left with nothing eventually. Store up things that are going to matter for when you get to the judgment seat and have the conversation of your life. And... That's what's important. That's where your heart should be. That's why yeah. we're, we're told not to rob God through tithe and offering. Uh, it's a warning. How they rob me with tithes and offering. If we're doing the right thing, then we don't become robbers. What a bad, what a sad thing to think about robbing God, who really don't need it, but want you to do so he can bless you for doing the right thing. <laughs> so what do we do with folks then that say there's not a single mention of tithing in the New Testament? Yeah, just do you want me to show you that? It's, it's Go ahead. Jesus I, I want somebody to show me where God ever changed his mind about tithing. If you show me that, then I might believe it's, it's charity. It is. It's charity uh, and giving. Yeah. And what you give to your neighbor, you're giving to Jesus. It's the same thing. When you give to a person in need or someone needs help, just pretend you're helping Jesus and then you'll get it. Yeah. There actually is a scripture, though. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember because we in did Matthew. it in a parable. Yeah. Um, what happens... He's, the only thing he ever commended the Pharisees for was their tithing. Yes. Everything else was bad, but he yeah. said, I commend you for that, but you, you're holding on to that's the, the epitome of the thing, where all this other, the good things that he wanted them to do, they weren't doing. You know? Well, look at the little widow when she dropped in that yeah. two bites. That's true. He commented yeah. on that. She gave more yes. than the rich were giving. A penny. So it's not ever like not by, the By the way, to die. Be, who, who brought that subject up? Jesus himself. He speaks more about giving. He said, he said, so if you think God isn't watching 
what you give, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> right. A, a penny from a pauper is as good as a million from a millionaire. Yep. All right. So, James talks about a lot about cheating workers out of their pay yeah. and, and not doing the right thing. What do you figure the point of talking about all that is? Fairness. Fairness. Mm. Yeah? Uh, a man is uh, worth his hire. You have to respect the worker for that. Uh huh. You have to give him what, what value he is. Everybody has value. And when you try to cheat someone out of their value, that's totally wrong. Well, if you'll cheat a person, you'll probably cheat God too. Um, so how can we use the resources that we have to help the poor? It's pretty simple. Outreach. <laughs> uh, it's Matthew 23, 23, by the way. Matthew 23, 23, 23. Go ahead and read it, 23, okay, 23. Okay. I'll, I'll add something to that. Okay. Here's what, this is Jesus, and he's talking about the Pharisees. Okay? He's talking to his disciples about the Pharisees. And he says in verse 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe on the mint and the dill and the cumin, and yet neglect. Now see what he said? He said you do all the, the tithing even down to your uh, spices and your whatever. But he says you've neglected the weightier provisions of, the, of law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. Now listen to what he says here. But these things you should have done without neglecting the others. So yeah. he says, don't neglect giving your tithe, but realize that that's not the epitome of it all. There's, there's a whole lot more than that. Because some people think, I just give to God, and I can do whatever I want. You know? Was that, is that a law? Was that a law back then, the tithe? I don't know. In the Old Testament. Okay. In the Old Testament. So they, that's it, you know, they're rule, they were rule followers. Yeah. And then all of a sudden Jesus switches to but, help in charity. And, the, and the difference is grace. Now let me ask you this. Do you think we should give more to God under the law requirement? Or should we give more to God because of grace, realizing what he's done for us? And responding to his love. When God's been the greatest giver of all, he's, he's given us his son. He's given us forgiveness. He's mm -hmm. given us so much. The greatest giver of all was God. Not us. Give, if we're going to reflect him, if people want to see uh, God in you, you've got to be a giver. So the question then is, we need to ask, are we doing what we can to ensure fairness and justice in the world? Um, we're not turning our heads or hiding from it or um, pretending that it doesn't exist. We are truly uh, people... Uh, faith and understanding God wants fairness, truth, and justice for everybody. And we, obviously, as individuals, treat everybody that way. But are we also doing something about the people and the places where that's not the case? I'm, I'm thinking that supporting missions and foreign missions is one of the greatest ways that we can help because missionaries don't go and just teach the gospel. They usually go with something in their hand to get them to strike up the conversations about the Lord. And if, if we should stress anything more, I think, today than we do, it should be giving to missions and raising that amount so they can do more and reach more to the ones that has less, especially the countries that has less. That is true. Uh, I occasionally go to Auburn, Alabama for a, a work thing, and on Wednesday I go to this very large Baptist church. <laughs> and it's kind of fun uh, just to be one of about seven or eight million, it seems like, in, okay. in the sanctuary, <laughs> even on a Wednesday. But one of the things I like about the church is, is while you're walking into the sanctuary, there's this huge board made out of um, brightly colored rocks. They might be fancy stones. I, I don't know. But it's huge. It's probably 10 foot tall. It's got a uh, one of those flat globe maps on it. 
and there's pins everywhere where that church is supporting um, a missionary or missionary family and the, I think there's 27 or 28 now mind you this is a large church so but I think um, that's just kind of a statement that as long as your heart is where your resources are going and that's a good thing then it doesn't really matter what you have as long as you as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do with what you do have and besides God really blesses us for giving I really believe that because Barb and I've always tied and <coughs> long story short short our kids think we're wealthy <laughs> they do you know because we have enough money to do with what we want but that's only the blessing from God it's not for our management of money I know one time I I was talking to my dad and, uh, and I told him about uh, uh, our giving he said son the only reason why you're giving that money <laughs> is at the end of the year you can take it off your income tax <laughs> and I thought then he added, I, it was so quick I, <laughs> but he added would you give if you could deduct it from your income tax yes. and I thought that was a real real good thing I had to think about it I well, really yes. did yes. Well, yes. if you give if you use an itemized deduction you know you only get the little bit and you only get, get 20 cents back on the dollar 14,000 to but, itemize now I know you need what? 14,000 to no, itemize. no, I don't. Well, Twenty-five. Well, I don't itemize anymore. Twenty-five. Anyway. I just give a standard deduction. Uh, that's Mary. <laughs> but that's, yes, that's not a formula. It never was the issue. Well, well yeah. it, the thing of it is, is <laughs> I, I didn't always tithe, and, and I admit that. And, and Gracie, most of it had, had come by after Grace and I was buried. We, and I have no bills. She convinced me that uh, we better start somewhere. <laughs> And you have to start to reap the benefits that come from it. And I, we don't miss it. I can tell you the truth. We don't miss it. It more than come back in our, and helping us out more than time in our. When bad things crop up and you think, boy, this is, what are we going to do now? And the answer comes. And we feel like that's the reason why part of it is because of our tithing and our giving. Not necessarily all tight, and we give to a lot of charities also. But like so Ray they, says, my mailbox is full of paper. <laughs> yeah. And I think that the reason why that is that we give to one organization and they sell that address to yes. somebody else. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, they yeah, say, here, we got this guy here. Is that a live one? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I think the point is for us then is to not feel bad about what we have or to look poorly upon rich people. As long as, um, you know, we're doing what we can do with what we are given, uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with having things, even though we are very rich people by worldly standards. All right? Let's go ahead and uh, go to our prayer list now. <clears throat>